Give him praise this morning. Glory to God. Wow, 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 wow. My goodness, you can be seated if you can. Wow. How amazing. Will you tell this praise and worship team how much you appreciate them? My goodness. Unbelievable. Man, we've had uh, some church, man, uh, last night, this morning at 830 and now this service, uh, we're so grateful to God that you're here, and uh, we expect God to do something really strong in your life. Uh, did you know that there are 21 different world religions that are recognized? 21 different world religions recognized. Did you know there's over 500 different kinds of Baptists? Man, that's scary just by itself, isn't it? <laughs> Over 500 different kinds of Baptists. A recent poll showed that 6 billion people on the planet claim to be religious. A poll showed that 85% of all Americans claim to be religious and 70% of Americans believe that Easter is a religious holiday. Wikipedia says that religion is a collection of belief systems, cultural systems, and moral values that relate to spirituality. There are many religions, many belief systems, and many confused people. I talk to people on a regular basis, and it's amazing how confused people are today. Uh, about everything. People are dazed and confused, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today, right? Being dazed and confused uh, on the box of TV dinners. Go home today and watch and, and read. Uh, the instructions include how to heat up in a microwave oven and also in a conventional oven. And in large letters, there's a warning that the product will be hot after heating it. We got some confused people out there, evidently, right? On the packaging of Rowenta irons, it says, do not iron clothes on your body. <laughs> what? I mean, I know it'd be a lot quicker to go in out the house, but it would hurt like heck, wouldn't it, right? I mean, don't iron clothes. Somebody had to have done that, right? I mean, people are evidently confused. The label on Tylenol PM and NyQuil, both of those, which by the way are sleep aids, says warning, may cause drowsiness. <laughs> People are confused. Swanson frozen dinners. Number one serving suggestion, defrost. <laughs> Thank you for that. Most Christmas lights. Now, you, you guys, uh, December, November, October, depending on how, you know, Christmassy you are, you put out those lights, right? When you do it that this year, go and look at the package and you will see, it will say, for indoor and outdoor use only, as opposed to what? <laughs> I mean, people are uh, confused, right? Uh, let me show you how confused people really are, all right? It's going to take some of you a minute to get this, okay? <laughs> Left, right, okay? <laughs> now, you may not know your geography, but that's Africa, okay? <laughs> People are confused. <laughs> wow. I don't know what this person was thinking, right? But they were definitely confused. Now, you may not be able to read this, but it's got this guy in this uh, twice. Up here, he's Teresa Kenny. Down here, he's Ben. <laughs> I'm sure he appreciated that a whole lot. <laughs> I want my money back, right? I mean, can you imagine? People are, are confused. That's really, you're really confused on this one. Be careful opening this sucker up, right? Look where the phone is. Y'all get it? Yeah. 
Love coming in first. How about you? Wow. I mean, how can, if you were driving and you came to this place and you saw that, would you not be completely out of your mind confused? Right? I mean, like, is this a trick? I mean, what's going, what's going on here? Right? Watch this one. This person was either confused or on crack, one of the two. <laughs> Not sure which one, but definitely something was going on here, right? <laughs> I don't know what to do. Confusion. <laughs> it's a really rough school, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, my God, that's really confusing. There's so many confusing things in the world today, and the most confusing thing is religion. Religion is the most confusing thing in the world because there's so many different kinds of religion. Islam says that Jesus was not crucified. Judaism says that Jesus was not crucified the Messiah. Buddhists look toward nirvana after 547 reincarnations. Humanists do not accept the creator of life. Spiritualists read your palms. Uh, The Mormons say they don't believe that Jesus was God in the flesh. Jehovah Witness, they say that Jesus did not physically resurrect. Bodily, physically resurrect. Spiritually, he resurrected, but not bodily and physically resurrected. Hindus preach a pluralistic and impersonal God. Do you realize that the founder of every single world religion, number one goal was to live and to be an example? But Jesus' number one goal was to die and then get up three days later. And so today, I want to be real clear. I, want to, I, don't want to, I don't want you to leave here today confused in any way. I want to be real clear, and I want you also to see a man named the Apostle Paul who wrote almost two-thirds of the New Testament. He wants you to be real clear as well because he lived a life of religion and confusion until he met Jesus. So we're going to be in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17. And if you've got a Bible and you like to open up and read it, you got got one on your phone, or you want to follow along with me here on the screen, let's do that. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, that's significant, his spirit was provoked, was troubled, was messed up within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be proclaiming a a foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Aeropagus. I know I'm not saying that right. And if you think you know how to say it, I don't believe you. <laughs> Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. That's a great text, right? Okay, so if you're here today for the first time, or maybe you're watching online for the first time, every single Sunday, every time I I speak, I always give a big idea, right? And so here's my big idea today. Listen carefully. Religion 
breeds confusion and uncertainty. The resurrection brings confidence and clarity. Religion makes things confusing. Religion always has a tag, a price. You got to do this. You got to do this. Where a relationship with God is completely, totally different. Now, watch what the Bible says. Now, while Paul waited for them in Athens, Paul preached, a little context, Paul preached in uh, northern Greece, a place called Thessalonica. He preached there for three weeks and a revival broke out and a riot broke out. When you read the Bible and you see the Apostle Paul preaching, either revival or riot or sometimes both broke out. And it did happen. People got saved. Matter of fact, the Bible says many prominent Greek people got saved. After that riot broke out, Paul had to escape and he went to a little town called Berea where he saw people get saved again in Greece. Then trouble came again and so he had to leave. So he boards the ship on uh, the Aegean Sea, and he travels 300 miles, right? Northern uh, Greece is Thessalonica, way southern Greece is Athens, right? And I've been to Athens, and it is a fascinating city, no doubt. And so while Paul waited at Athens... Now, if you've ever been to Athens and you walked up there, you see all these statues, all these temples, all these uh, gods, all the Greek mythology, all the, the Parthian is up there. All these different things are up there. And Paul is walking around and he's seeing all these things, all these people, all these temples, all this stuff, all this religious stuff. And he gets provoked in his spirit. He literally gets troubled. He's looking at all these people and he's going like, God, they're hopeless, they're helpless, they're lost. These people, they're, they're following idols and statues and false gods, and he's messed up in his heart because idols were everywhere, religious stuff everywhere. He says to himself, everybody here believes in something, they just don't really know what they believe. They're not certain of what they believe. They're confused because religion breeds confusion. Now, the people of Athens were very religious, very uh, philosophical, right? Because you know uh, not only Greek mythology, but you've heard of people like Plato, right, and Aristotle, and Socrates, right, all those great philosophers, right? And so those were the people that lived there, uh, and, and these are the people that actually Paul is talking to. Now watch this. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happen to be there. So Paul shows up at a city, and the very first thing he does, he goes to a Jewish synagogue, right? And he tells them that, hey, I got great news for you. The Messiah has come in the flesh, God in the body, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, his come. Then he goes to the Gentile worshipers and say, hey, I got great news. Christ saves you, can change you, can forgive you. And then as you check it out, he goes to the marketplace. So he's talking to a bunch of people, different people, different religious people, people with different points of view, and he's having a conversation with all of those people, all of them different backgrounds, different religions, but all of them deeply confused. Now watch. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered Paul. Epicurean. The Epicureans were people that uh, were based everything on emotion, right? They wanted to feel something. They wanted to have the goosebumps going on, right? They wanted to uh, have an experience, right? So the Epicureans, they wanted to have an experience. They wanted to feel something. The Stoics were more intellectual. They were deep thinkers, right? So theirs was based on logic and left brain thinking, right? And so one group wanted to feel. The other one wanted to think. And so Paul is talking to both groups. Hey, I know you want a feeling. Hey, I know you want to figure this out. So let me tell you the truth about what's going on. And so here's what he says. Others say he seems to be proclaiming foreign gods. They called him a babbler, right? That word babbler in the Greek New Testament is a word that means uh, uh, he's speaking something we've never heard before. 
And so here's what Paul says. He says, guys, guys, listen, listen. I see all your idols. I see all your temples. I see all your statues. I see all your sculptures. I saw all your Greek mythology everywhere. But listen, guys, listen. Let me tell you about a God that wants to have a personal relationship with you. Let me tell you about a God that loves you so much that he sent his only son, that he literally died on a cross. They stripped him down naked. They beat him up unrecognizable, Isaiah 52, 14. They laughed at him. They spit at him. They mocked him. God poured his wrath on his son on a cross. God judged you, judged Jesus instead of judging you. He died for you. He was buried. Three days later, he came crashing up out of that grave. You can have a personal relationship with God. They never heard that before. A God who loves you, a God who's crazy, madly in love with you. And so they've never heard that before. And so Paul is preaching them the cross and the resurrection. You guys are serving dead gods. You guys are serving myths and, and, and tradition and religion and culture. But you're missing the fact that Jesus Christ not only died, but he got up from the dead. You see, religion breeds confusion and uncertainty, but the resurrection brings confidence and clarity. Watch this. Then Paul stood in the midst of this Aeropagus, and he said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're very religious. Uh, this Aeropagus was a court, and this court had to give approval for anybody that wanted to speak about religion in the marketplace. Now, remember, this is Athens, right? I mean, people everywhere, that's all they did was hang out. When you read the entire chapter of Acts chapter 17, it tells you that all they did every day long was just hang out and talk religion and politics. Boy, that'll, that'll really encourage you, won't it? Religion and politics all day long, that's all they talked about. And so this court had to give permission for anybody to be able to stand up and talk about their religion and so Paul gets permission, and he stands up, right? And he says, guys, listen, I, I perceive y'all are y'all religious. I mean, everywhere I turn around, I see a temple, I see a statue, I see something. It, you guys are super, super religious. <laughs> you're real religious, but you're not really certain about anything. Watch this. For I was passing through and considering all your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Hey, I was walking around seeing all this stuff, and I even found an inscription to an unknown God. A hundred years ago, archaeologists found in Athens an inscription on an altar to the unknown God. They also found one in Pergamon, uh, 70, 80 years ago, to the unknown God. You see, unknown God means just in case we missed one. Just in case this God shows up, we can say, hey, we didn't know your name, but hey, we got an altar for you. We want to cover all the bases because, see, that's exactly what religion does. Religion covers all the bases. Religion always says, hey, you better make sure that you dot those I's, that you cross those T's. Religion always says, you got to cover the bases. And so they were very, very religious, but they weren't certain about anything because they didn't know where they stood with God. Those are the conversations that I have on a weekly basis with people. They don't know where they stand with God because religion is about doing I've got to achieve. I've got to accomplish. I've got to appease God. I've got to make God happy. I don't want to anger the gods, right? And so I've got to do something in order to please God and appease God. When you don't have to do anything, it's not what you do, do, do. It's what he's already done, done, done. He's already paid the price for your sin and risen from the dead. So to the unknown God, hey, just in case. Just in case, I better go to confession. Just in case. Just in case, I, I, I better pray with some kind of beads or something. Just in case. Just in case, 
When my baby gets to be about a month old, I better rush my baby up to church really fast and get baptized just in case. That's what religion always is just in case, just in case the unknown God. Paul says, okay, you admit there's a God. You know that you don't know everything, but you also know there's uncertainty. Now watch. The one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. Hey, listen, let me tell you, you guys are worshiping because something inside of you tells you that there's someone to worship. The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 1 that your conscience tells you there's God. Ecclesiastes says that God has written eternity on your hearts. Every single person knows that there really is a God because God has written it inside your conscience. You know there's a God. You go outside and you look up in the sky and you go, there's a creator There's a God. So you know there's a God by your conscience. You know there's a God by creation. You know there's a God. And so Paul says, hey, you're worshiping. Let me tell you about the one that you think you know, but you don't. Let me tell you about the God who loves you, that died for you, that rose from the dead. Let me fill in your gap. You're religious. You're uncertain. Religion breeds uncertainty. You never know where you stand. Can you imagine if you had to obtain and do good and be good in order to go to heaven, when would you ever know that you were acceptable? How would you ever know that you've done enough? I was on an airplane recently, and it happens to me all the time. I have a conversation with people on a plane, and this guy says to me, he says, tell me the difference between your religion and and my religion. I said, I, I think it's really simple. I said, matter of fact, I will tell you the difference between religion, all religions, and Christianity. He said, oh, you're, you're not religious? I said, oh, no, I'm not. He said, you said you were a pastor. I said, I am, but I'm not religious. I have a relationship. He said, well, what's the difference? I said, okay. I said, here's the difference. I said, so your religion teaches that you have to do A and B and C and D and E in order to obtain heaven. Is that right? He said, absolutely. I said, see, mine is reverse. You have to make your way up to God. But see, the Bible teaches that God made his way down to you. Right? I don't have to do and all follow the rules and do this and do this and do this to appease God, God came down to me in the flesh. Jesus lived a perfect sinless life for 33 years and died on a cross and rose from the dead. And so Paul says, let me give you some lessons that you need to understand. And let me give you some lessons on Easter Sunday that you need to understand. You ready? Lesson number one. Oh, first of all, yeah, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. All right, God is bigger than your religion. Amen. God is bigger than your religion. Hey, you know that temple over there? Hey, my God can't fit in that temple. My God is too big to fit into your religious system. My God does not fit in your religion and your culture and your tradition. My God is bigger than your religion. And you got to get that today. God is bigger than your religion. All your temples, all, all, listen, you're thinking too small. God can't fit into your religious system. He's too big. He's God. God can't fit into your little box, but he can fit into your heart if you let him. God's bigger than your religion. Let me tell you another lesson. You can't do anything for him to gain his acceptance. Man, if I can just try harder and do better. Man, I tell you what, Pastor Steve, on this Easter, I'm making a commitment that I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to be a better person. I'm going to start coming to church. All that's awesome and great, but that doesn't take you to heaven when you die. Man, I'm going to start reading the Bible. I'm going to start praying. I'm going to start doing this and start doing that. That's all awesome. But none of those get you into heaven when you die. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. You don't get to heaven by doing. You get to heaven by receiving. And so 
You can't do anything for him to gain acceptance. All you guys are doing these sacrifices and bowing down to these altars and doing all this kind of craziness, all this religious frenzy. But you can't do anything to gain God's acceptance. Matter of fact, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Since he gives to all life, breath, and all things, God doesn't need anything. God is, the, God is the author of life. God breathed life into you. He doesn't need you to do anything for him. He's done everything for you. And when you understand that, then you're willing to give yourself to him. And so religion breeds Confusion and uncertainty. The resurrection brings confidence and clarity. Lesson number three, he's alive and well, and you can have a personal relationship with him. You can't have a relationship with a dead God. You can't have a relationship with a statue. You can't have a relationship with religion. But you can have a relationship with a holy God. So many people, I ask this question to do you know for certain, without a shadow of a doubt, if you died, you'd go to heaven? Well, that's a big question, isn't it? Do you know as well as you know you're sitting here right now that if you died, you'd go to heaven? Most people, when I ask that, they say, yeah. I say, really? Well, tell me how you know that. Well, I'm a good person. I'm moral. I'm good. I'm decent. I had somebody recently say to me, I obey the Ten Commandments. I said, all of them? <laughs> they said, well, like 80%. I said, well, you know what the Bible says? They said, what? I said, if you break one, you're guilty of all of them. Yeah. Dang. Break one, you're guilty of all of them. So do you know for certain, without a shadow of a doubt, if you died, you'd go to heaven? Well, I guess so. My wife and I were talking to a lady, and uh, you can't make this stuff up. This lady said, yes, I know 100% sure that if I died right now, I'd go to heaven. I said, awesome, praise God, tell me what. She said, my grandfather gave land to build a church. <laughs> I looked over my wife. I wanted to go. <laughs> Dang. Your grandfather gave land and they built a church, right? That's, that's religion. I did something to obtain salvation. You don't, listen, people are confused and have no idea. Religion is the most damnable thing there is. Amen. My wife was extremely religious. My wife was good, moral, decent person. Man, I'd party. She wouldn't party. She'd go, but she didn't party. She didn't do the stuff that I did at the parties. And I did drugs and alcohol and craziness. She didn't do any of that. She was a good, moral, decent person. She went to church on Sunday, every Sunday. She was good. And she thought she was going to heaven because she was so good until she realized that her goodness wasn't good enough. That the Bible says all your good works are like filthy rags. And she got saved. She gave me a Christian. I, I wasn't religious. I wasn't that person that went to church. I was 20 years of age and heard the greatest news in all the world. Thank God. I didn't hear about religion. I heard about a relationship and gave my life to Christ. And today, you can do the same thing because people are so confused. Let me tell you about a lady that got really confused. This lady uh, was kind of, uh, uh, she's from the north, and she uh, was very prim and very proper, Right? And she spoke really well. And she didn't want to use words uh, that didn't sound right. And she wanted her husband and her to go to Florida to this campground. But she wanted to find out about the toilet facilities at the campground, right? So it was real important to her. I want to know about the toilet facilities. Well, she wrote the email, and when she read it, she said, I can't use the word toilet facilities. And so she's trying to think of a different word, and she thought, bathroom commode. I'll, how, do you, how, what about your bathroom commodes? And then she couldn't bring herself to write that either. So she finally said, well, they'll know what I'm talking about. I mean, I'll just write BC. So she wrote the email and asked, can you tell me about your BC facilities? The camp director got 
the email and he read it and he, he said, BC, I, what is she talking about? I'm, I'm confused. And so he went to other campers. He said, hey, do you guys know what she's talking about? And then one person spoke up and said, of course, she's talking about a Baptist church. <laughs> and so he said, oh, of course. So he writes her back and here's what he says. Dear ma'am, I now take pleasure in informing you that the BC is located nine miles north of the campground. <laughs> it's capable of seating 250 people. <laughs> I admit it's quite a distance away if you're in the habit of going regularly. <laughs> but no doubt you'll be pleased to know that a great number of people take their lunches along and make a day of it. They arrive early and stay late. It is such a beautiful facility, and the acoustics are marvelous. <laughs> Even the normal delivery sounds can be heard. The last time my wife and I went was six years ago. And it was so crowded, we had to stand up the whole time we were there. It may interest you to know that right now there's a supper plan to raise money to buy more seats. I would like to say it pains me very much not to be able to go more often. But it's no lack of desire on my part. As I grow older, it seems to be more of an effort, particularly in cold weather. If you decide to come down to our campground, perhaps I can go with you the first time you go. I will sit with you, and I will introduce you to all the other folks around, <laughs> because we have a very friendly campground. <laughs> That's a little confusing, right? You know, it's one thing to be confused about a restroom, and there's another thing to be confused about where you spend eternity at. Where will you spend eternity? I want you to think about what's happened in your life over the last couple months, and I want you to connect the dots. I want you to think about the people that God has brought into your life, the things that you've heard, the things that you've said, the things that people have said to you, things that you've seen maybe on television. Somebody invited you to church. Somebody's been begging you to come to church forever, and, they, and you finally showed up. And God has been connecting the dots. And if you'll allow God to connect the dots in your mind and quit being confused. Some of you are confused as a termite and a yo-yo. I, I, I don't know. Am I going to heaven? Am I going to heaven? Hell, am I going to heaven? You don't know. And that you can know. Because the Bible says, these things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know. So let me give you some takeaways. If you're here today for the first time, I always give takeaways. Most people who reject God are really rejecting religion. You got hurt in church. Somebody hurt you. Something bad happened in church. Somebody disappointed you. Somebody let you down. Somebody hurt your feeling. And what happened to you maybe many, many years ago, and you haven't been to church in a long time, because you equated that experience with God. Instead, that experience was religion. And so most people who reject God are not really rejecting God. They're rejecting religion because if you really knew him, you would love him. Amen. To know him is to love him. Amen. And so most people really are just not rejecting God. You're not rejecting God. You're, re you're rejecting a religious system that does not represent him very well. Amen myself on that. Because Jesus rose from the dead, it verifies and validates everything he said and everything he did. Jesus rose from the dead. If any man can predict his own death and his own resurrection and pull it off, then you listen to everything he says. Amen. Everything. And Jesus did. He predicted his own death. He predicted his own resurrection. And by the way, he predicted his coming again one day. And are you ready? And then 
The big idea today, right? Religion breeds confusion and uncertainty. You're confused. You're uncertain. You don't know where you stand with God. But the resurrection brings confidence and clarity. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because he lives, up from the grave, he arose. And when you invite him to come into your life, when you get saved, when you get born again, when Christ lives in you, you become a new person. Old things passed away, but all things become new. You can't get Jesus without being changed. And today, I want to encourage you to trade your religion for a relationship. Do you know where you stand with God? Do you have great confidence today that if, God forbid, that you would die today, do you know that you would spend eternity in heaven? Not because you've done something, but because you received someone. There's a difference. Let's pray together. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed in the quietness of this moment. Pastor Steve, I'll be honest with you, I don't know. I don't know 100% sure. I hope so. I guess so. I think so. But I really don't know so. You don't know that if you died, you'd be in heaven. You don't know that your sins have been forgiven. You don't know without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus actually lives inside of you. But God is speaking and you know it. Today I want to encourage you to trade your religion for a relationship. All the do's and all the don'ts and all the things you have to do to obtain a relationship and to try to appease God, God's already done it through Christ. He loves you. He died for you. He rose from the dead. And now he wants to step out of heaven and step into your life and forgive you and change you. But that choice is yours. And today I hope you make the right choice. Pastor Steve, that's me. I don't know, but I want to know. And God is speaking to my heart right now. Pastor Steve, how do I know if God is speaking to my heart? You know it. You know it. And for many of you right now, it's happening. Don't, don't get Taylor Swift. Don't, don't shake it off. Receive it. Say, God, I need you. If that's you, I'm going to pray a prayer right now. And as I say it out loud, I want to invite you to say it with me in your heart. You got to mean it. No playing games, no fooling around. This is serious business. This is you giving your life to God. And if that's your desire today, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Not a magical prayer, but a prayer that if you'll pray, God will save you. Say these words to him. Say, Jesus, oh God, I don't know 100% sure that if I died, I'd be in heaven. But God, I, I want to know. I need to know. I know that I've sinned against you, and, and I'm really sorry. I am willing today to turn away from my sin. I believe you, Jesus, that you died for me and that you rose from the dead. And right now, I give you my heart. I give you my life. Please save me and forgive me. Thank you, God, for hearing my prayer. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We are so excited that today you decided to join us online. We hope today that you were encouraged and blessed by the Word of God and encouraged today to walk with God in a deeper, more intimate way. For some of you, you just prayed that prayer with us. You just invited Jesus Christ to come into your heart. And if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, do you realize that Jesus just saved you? Your sins just got 
forgiven. And that is the greatest thing in all the world. Matter of fact, the Bible says that all of heaven throws a party because you just said yes to Jesus Christ. And so we want to encourage you to read the Bible, to pray, to find you a, a church home that you may be involved in, or even on this online campus we've got going on here, or I want to encourage you, if you just prayed that prayer, to let us know about that. Matter of fact, you can text your response to 470-509-5139. I want to encourage you to do that right now. Don't wait. You don't have to think about it. If you just prayed that prayer, text that response to us and let us know, and then we will get back with you and help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Again, thanks for watching us online.